Hello and welcome back, my precalculites. We are onward and upward in our first chapter of precalculus. You should have these pre-printed notes. La, 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 la. I gave these away free in class today if you were here. If not, you can go to Moodle and print them off. We're going to be talking about functions today. And um, you want the funk? There's a song about that. We're going to be talking about the function definition and notation, domain and range, continuity, increasing and decreasing, boundedness, local and absolute extrema, symmetry, asymptotes, and end behavior. That's for the whole section. I'm going to be splitting up the videos so that it's not so much. Functions and graphs form the basis for understanding the mathematics and applications you'll see both in your workplace and in the coursework in college. And functions are used to make predictions, to analyze data, and so on. Very important. We had numerical modeling and algebraic modeling. This is the reason we do mathematics. Here's some rules and properties. In case you forgot, a function is a rule that assigns each value of the first variable to exactly one value of the second variable. What this means is an x cannot have two different y's. An x cannot have two different y's. And they use something known as the vertical line test to determine if an x has two different y's. Because if you think about it, let's say I have the point 3, 2, and 3, 5. These have the same x's, but different y's. But if we plot those, one is going to be right above the other. So a vertical line is going to hit that twice. So a vertical line can only hit a graph once if it's a function. All you're doing is making sure that an x does not have two different y's. So let's look at this thing, the vertical line test. If you have a graph, every vertical line can only intersect the graph once to determine whether it's a function or not. So if I look at this first graph, watch for it, woo, animation, you can see that that vertical line, when I slide it back and forth, it only will hit the graph in one spot at a time. So that's a function. If I draw a different relation, for example an ellipse, I can see that that vertical line will intersect the graph in two different spots at a time. So that is not a function. That's all there is to it. So all we have to do on these three graphs is determine which one is or is not a function. So this first one passes the vertical line test, it is a function. If I look at this next one, no matter where I would draw a vertical line, it would only hit the graph in one spot. So this is also a function. This one, though, doesn't belong, because if I draw a vertical line, it will intersect that function's graph in more than one spot. So this is not a function as it fails the vertical line test. Determine which, whether the formula determines y as a function of x. If you recall, x squared plus y squared, and we're going to graph these, this is the equation of a circle. x squared plus y squared equals a radius squared. So in order to draw this, I know the center is 0, 0, because x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. That's the standard form of the equation of a circle, and your center is hk. Since we have no numbers grouped with the x's and y's, we know that our center is 0, 0, and our radius is r. So the formula says r squared. Since this is a 4, r squared equals 4, so the radius is going to be 2. If I plot this, I say here's my center, and I just, in order to sketch this on graph paper, I just go two units out to the left, to the right, up and down, and then I just sketch in the circle. So is that a function or not? I think not. It'll hit the vertical line you can see right here, would hit it in more than one spot. So this is not a function. This guy right here, if I solve him, he's a linear equation. So x plus y equals 12 might be the easiest way to do this. Two numbers, you're going to plot all the pairs of numbers that add up to 12. For instance, 6 and 6, 5 and 7. 3 and 9 and so on. So that's going to be these numbers right here. And you're going to get a straight line. One clue, almost every line is a function. The only one that is not a function is, is a vertical line. So the, if it's a vertical line, that's the only kind of line that is not a function. So this guy is a function. Moving on. Domain. Oh, yes. I know you're saying, oh, yes, I was waiting for more domain problems. 
All the domain is, is the set of all first coordinates. It's all the x's of your functions. It's what you can put into a function. You cannot put a value into a function that makes it undefined. So this is all the values you can put in the function without making the function undefined. All right, the range of a function is the second set of coordinates. It's the y's of a function. It's what comes out of the function. And there's a couple ways that you can find domain and range. I'm going to go over both ways, but most students prefer the graphing way. It's more visual and easier to understand. So find the domain of a function algebraically and support it graphically. The first way we're going to learn is the algebraic way. Just by looking at the equation, what's the domain? And remember that the domain, you cannot put anything in for x that makes it undefined. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, what makes it undefined? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Can't have a zero in the denominator. That's one of the things I check. No negatives under even roots. So no negatives under a square root, under a fourth root, under a sixth root, and so on. And graphically, this is the easy thing. When you're talking about your x's, you're going to look left to right on the graph. You look going across. Are, all, are there values, y values for all of those x's? If there's y values for all of those x's, you know the domain is all reals. So you're kind of looking for what you can't put in for x. The range is the y's, the outputs. And what you do for the range is you say, can the output be negative, positive, zero? That'll clue you in if there's anything that is not going to come out of a function. For example, if you have y equal x squared, x squared can never be negative. So you know that the range is not going to include negative numbers because the output, when you put anything in for x, you can't get a negative back out. You also look and see if there's any values eliminated from the domain because that will make that y value eliminated as well. When you look graphically, you're just going to look up and down at the graph. So you're going to look up and down when it comes to range and see that there's a, there's a graph portion for all values of y. There's all y's are represented or which ones skip, which ones jump. All right, so let's look at the domain for this first guy. I see an x in the denominator right away since we're just looking for the domain. I notice I cannot have a zero in the denominator. So that means x, I can't put something in for x that makes the denominator equal to zero. So that means x minus 3 cannot equal 0, so x cannot equal 3. When you have something like this, x cannot equal a number, it forms what's known as a vertical asymptote. So when I have something with an asymptote, I do the dashed line for that right away. Notice this is a dashed line going down 3. x equal a number is a vertical line. An asymptote is a line that your graph is going to get closer and closer to without touching. That's going to be the only value that I cannot put in for x. I can put anything else in for x, negative, positive, um, and so on, zero. I can put all those numbers in. So since that's the only value eliminated from the domain, I'll say that the domain is everything except 3. In interval notation, I'll put negative infinity to 3 with a round parenthesis around the 3, union 3 to positive infinity. That's the domain. If I go ahead and graph that function, this is what he's going to look like. That's what a rational function looks like. Later, we'll go in, and I know it didn't ask you, but it can never equal zero. Do you notice how if I look all the way across, and this is how you, if I look graphically all the way across, I have a graph, 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 no graph, 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 graph. You see how that works? There's graphs everywhere except x equal 3. It jumps over that value. So that also clues you into the domain. Right, let's take a look at the next one. Here again, you have an x in the denominator, but you have a double whammy because you've got x in the denominator and you've got it under your radical. So right here, you know x cannot equal 3. Also, you know that you cannot have a negative under a square root for the domain. So 4 minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. So when you do this out, that you have to solve that equation. 4 minus x squared has to be bigger than or equal to 0. So the opposite of x squared has to be greater than or equal to 4. And if you do this out, x squared would have to be less than or equal to positive 4, which means absolute value of x has to be less than or equal to 2. And so x has to be between negative 2 and 2. Some people can go from here to here, but I would put this intermediate step in there. So I know that my domain 
is constricted between negative 2 and 2, this guy doesn't really matter because 3 is bigger than 2. I can't have a negative under the square root, so he wins out. If I graph this guy, it's just going to be a little smiley face. If you look on your graphing calculator, it gives you this little curve going downward like that. And our domain is negative 2 to 2. Here again, if I look graphically, if I go from the left, there's no graph, no graph, no graph, no graph, 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 no graph, no graph, no graph. So there's only a graph from here to here. It clues me in to uh, what my domain is. And so my domain only goes from negative 2 to positive 2. I will work more with you in class over finding the domains because for some reason this um, confuses people. Let's look at this guy. Find the domain of a function. So we've got the square root of x plus 2. So you can see graphically we can tell what the domain is going to be. The domain is just going to be from negative 2 on up because we look left to right. That's my x values. So for the x values of negative 2 on up, we have graph. If I do this algebraically, remember that what's under your square root has to be greater than or equal to 0. And when you solve that out, you'll get x greater than or equal to negative 2. And this would be your domain. So there's two different ways to, to figure out the domain. Let's look at the range now. Switching over to the output of the function, I like doing the range with the graph. That is my preference. So if I do this 10 minus x squared and I graph that guy, here's what he looks like. To do the range, I look up and down. So if I look up and down, I can see that there's no y value higher than 10. So from here down, this will be our range. And our range will be y less than or equal to 10, because 10 is included in the y value in the range. So y less than or equal to 10, you could write it like that, or an interval notation will be negative infinity to negative 10. I just think it's much easier to do the range graphically. If I look at this guy, I graph it. First thing I graph are the asymptotes. And right here, positive or negative 2 would make the denominator 0. That's going to be my vertical asymptotes. And then when I graph this function on my calculator, here's what I end up with. Now, if you notice, as I go upward, up and down, I have graph going all the way down up to, it looks like uh, about 1 or 3 fourths or something like that, and then above here. So we know there's values missing from here to here in our range. So there's no y values in that gap. The range is going to be y greater than or equal to 0.75, and you're going to also have a horizontal asymptote at 1, negative 1. And you have to just look real careful on your graph to see how that lines up. So my range is going to be y is less than negative 1. So I've got y greater than or equal to 0.75 or y less than negative 1. And that would be my range. I would write it like this in interval notation. From negative infinity up to negative 1, union 0.75 to positive infinity. It includes the 0.75 because if x is 0 and 0, that gives you three fourths there. Okay, right. I know domain and range gives people fits, but hopefully I can get everything cleared up in class and it just takes practice with these. I think graphically is a much easier way to figure out what the domain and range are. Let's look on to continuity. Now continuity is a very simple concept. All I have to know is that a function is continuous if you can draw its graph without lifting your pencil from the paper. So right here, if I were to draw this graph, I could draw right along the graph without lifting my pencil up. It's a continuous function. Continuous functions come into play in calculus. In order to do certain operations, we have to know whether a function is continuous on a certain interval. So if I look, there's different types of discontinuities. Right here, you have the holy graph. Holy graph! and this guy is considered a whole, and what creates a whole in a function is when a factor in the denominator cancels with a factor in the numerator. Even though those cancel out in our original function, they were there. So you have to put a hole, you have to graph a hole there. A jump discontinuity, you can see that there's a gap between here and here. That's a discontinuity that it jumps. The graph jumps from here to here. I, I don't know. There's not much else I can say about that one. 
infinite discontinuity is where you have your asymptote. So this one, you can see you've got a vertical asymptote at x equal a. So it is the three types of discontinuity. This one is the only one that is considered removable. You can remove it because you know the function intends to be right that value where that hole is. So the y value for x equal a, that would be your um, removable discontinuity. You know that value. What the, so let's look at the identifying points of discontinuity. Which of the following figures shows functions that are discontinuous at x equal 2? So you're either looking for a hole, a jump, or something going on at x equals 2. If I look at this one, this guy is continuous all on this interval. If I look at this guy, boom, there's a hole there. So that hole is a removable discontinuity, and that is the function that is discontinuous at x equals 2. Function on the right is not defined at x equals 2 and cannot be continuous. This is a removable discontinuity. Now, graph these on your graphing calculator. You can also look at the table. If it says error, that is a discontinuity, and it's also a value that is thrown out of the domain. Let's do a couple of these that you have on your paper. It says to graph the function and tell whether or not it has a point of discontinuity at x equals 0. If there is a discontinuity, tell whether it is removable or non-removable. Remember, the holes are the only ones that are removable. If I graph this function, 3 plus x squared divided by x, x cannot equal 0. So right away, you know that's discontinuous. So if I do this one, here's what he looks like. And notice you actually have what's called an oblique asymptote. You're going to have a line going this way that your graph seems to be approaching. So this guy has a discontinuity at x equals 0. It is non-removable. It is an infinite discontinuity. This guy right here, can I put 0 in for x? That kind of clues you in. It's not got a discontinuity. It's only discontinuous at x equals 3. So if I draw this guy, I've got an asymptote at 3 because that would make the function undefined. And you can draw that. You've also got an oblique asymptote here, which we'll get to later. We'll talk about all those asymptotes later. So this is where I'm going to end the day for part 1 of section 1.2, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.